Okay. Uh, well, that was interesting. So, okay. Again, we're, so again, we're going to start and everyone, let's start from the beginning. Everyone give a round. We're going to officially start the Maker Faire this time and give a round of applause for everyone. Okay. Our first presenter is Anish Marawa from Ashland Innovation 4-H Club, and he's going to be presenting the automatic self-watering plant project. So Anish, you can go ahead. Can you guys see my screen? Yep, we can see it. Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Rabbit's Will Innovation 4-H Virtual Maker Fair. I'm Anish Maruba from the Ashland Innovation 4-H Club. And today I'll be presenting my automatic self-watering plant project. Today we'll be discussing about what problems I'm solving why did I choose to do this project, components used, and how it works? Why did I choose to do this project? I chose to do this project because plants die for many reasons. Do you know why plants die? Sometimes plants die because of too much water and too less water. Sometimes people forget to water their, water their plants. Sometimes when people are gone for a vacation, they can't take care of their plants. This happened to my family as well. Once we went for a vacation for 10 days, and once we came back home, most of our plants were sick and were about to die. What problems am I solving? With my project, I'm preventing plants from dying with too much water and too less water. I'm also saving water, people's time, and money. My solution to these problems. I thought it would be helpful if there was a product that could check the plant's water level and water it when needed. Components used in this project. Adreno board, soil moisture sensor, DC motor, breadboard, motor drive shift, power supply module, nine volt battery, and chapter wires. How it works. My project's theory is that my water level sensor is constantly checking for the plant's water level. Whenever the, water, the plant's water level is low, it sends a message to the Trino port. Then the Adreno board reads the data and then it sends a message to the motor drive chip, which turns on the DC motor. Then, but then the water level sensor detects that the water level is high and then the DC motor will stop spinning. Logic behind the circuit. To make my project work, I wrote an Adreno code. The Adreno code has two functions. The first function is void setup. This function initializes and defines the pins that are connected to the Arduino board. The second function is called void loop. The void loop is constantly checking for the plant's water level, and based on those values, it turns and turns off the DC motor. How did I make my water pump? To make my water pump, I have used two syringes, hot glue, and the plastic tube to make the water pump. I have cut the outer part of the syringe and made a hole. And then I use the inner part of the syringe as a fin blade for my DC motor. And then I inserted the plastic tube using hot glue and the hole on the outer part of the syringe. This is how I made my water. Why did I use a motor drive chip? I used a motor drive chip to control the DC motor, when to turn off and turn on and give it give the DC motor the amount of power it needs. Where is my project useful? My project is useful in indoor gardening, vertical farming, outdoor gardening, and greenhouse farming. For future enhancements, I am planning to add a Bluetooth module so you can choose and make an app for it. So you can choose your plant that you have, and then they would pour the right amount of water 
for the airplane. My progress. So now I am going to give you a life demo. Roshni, can you switch to the other video? Uh, uh, Anish, one. Yeah, Auntie. We're uh, we're look at we're spotlight. We're gonna spotlight it. Yeah, we got it. Anish, uh, would you mind uh, speaking into the microphone or have um, your mom or dad get closer to your Little better, but not uh, completely. Can you speak a little louder, Anish? Can you hear now? Yeah, that sounds good. Okay. So, and then this here is my soul moisture sensor back here. It's in black. And then this is the water pump that I made by myself. And also I'm planning to make future enhancements for this water box. So whenever it runs out of water, there would be no way to alert you. So I'm planning to make another Bluetooth module for it. So when it's out of water, it will send a message to you. Like that. So now my soil moisture sensor has detected that there's enough water for the plant. So my water pump stopped pumping water to the plant. Thank you. Any questions? That is great, Anish. Thank you very much uh, for presenting. Um... Yeah, it's like uh, the first time we are doing it, right? He's a first year in our club. Um, it's like, you know, uh, we just want to put the younger kids and he did a good, good job. Like, um, so... Let's go next. Thank you, guys. Yeah, thank you, Anish. Uh, one, one thing before. Um, so one request to all the parents who are helping um, their kids with the, the video, uh, please use uh, the horizontal video so it will be easy to view on the screen. And make sure if you're using two devices, please mute the second device so that uh, there won't be an echo. All right. Okay. Good job, guys. Good luck. And uh, let's proceed. Back to Roshni. Okay. Uh, good job, Anish. Uh, next up is Hansa Kunduru from the Ashburn Innovation Club with the Electronic Pest Control. I'm just going to share my screen. Can you guys see my screen? Yeah. Yes. Hi, my name is Hansa, and next year I'll be going to fifth grade. I'm from the Loudoun Innovation 4-H Club, and my project is the electronic pest repellent. Here's a problem. Almost every single day in the world, every farmer and gardener, they struggle to grow their crops due to, an due to animals and insects eating them. It applies to the whole world. And although most of the people use pesticides, it is not only harmful to them but it is also harmful for humans here's my solution i have created a product which will generate a sound based on the animal or insect that has approached and it will make that sound based on the animal or insect and after that's done the animal or insect will be scared by the sound and run away 
There is also a remote to adjust the sound levels. And my project is non-toxic, it's human and environment friendly, and it can get rid of spiders, roaches, mice, ants, and mosquitoes. Why I made this product and why it's important why it's important to me. Now, let me ask you a quick question. How many of you guys are from a farming background? I assume that only a few of you are. But my par my grandparents back in India, they still do farming and they struggle to grow their crops and plants because of animals and insects like deers, monkeys, and elephants eating them. And that causes them to roam around in the hot sunny weather around each and every corner to make sure that they don't approach. But the thing is that it is very scary and frightening to scare away the big animals like elephants because they are so big. And that's why I came up with the electronic pest repeller. And a big thanks to the Robinsville Innovation 4-H Club for helping. Now we're talking about my stats. And also, this is only one of the reasons why farmers and gardeners are struggling to grow their crops, but there are many more reasons why. Locust swarms weigh 2 grams and they eat as much as they weigh. Yeah, they eat a lot. And between 2003 and 2005, it was estimated about 2.5 billion of crop damage. That's a lot of damage and very harmful. And studies show that children who grew up during that period, during that time of period, they were much less likely to go to school. It even impacted children's education. And they would say that the locusts are in your field for a morning, and by midday, there would hardly be anything left in your field. So these are a few pictures of my building process. You can take a few seconds to look at them. And this is my finished shirt circuit. And the components that I have that I have used in my project are is a breadboard, a piezo buzzer, an IR receiver module, 10 jumper wires, an ultrasonic sensor, a remote, and a microcontroller. This and also so the next slide is just um, a picture of my research and it basically shows different animals and the different frequencies that they can hear. So for example, humans can hear from 20 hedges to 20,000 hedges compared to bats, they can hear from 7,000 hedges to 200,000 hedges. That's a really big difference. So, and also make sure that if you want to scare an animal away, you should know how many hedges that they can hear. So, um, my future enhancements is that um, I want my project to identify what animal has approached the garden and I wanted to generate the frequency of sound dynamically. Now we're giving you a demo of my project. A live demo. Can you guys see the circuit? Yes. So as you can see, I have an IR receiver module an ultrasonic sensor and a piece a piece of buzzer and a remote. So now we're explaining how my project works. The ultrasonic sensor is continuously monitoring to see if any animal has approached. And when it does, it will send a signal to the piezo buzzer, which will make the sound based on the animal or insect that has approached. But if you want to change the frequencies of sounds, I have a remote here. So I'm just going to share my serial monitor so you guys can see how it works. Okay. Can you guys see the serial monitor? Yeah, we can see it. Mm -hmm. So for example, if you press number one, that's for a deer. And it also says it on the serial monitor. So, and also pay attention to the sounds because they're kind of hard to hear, especially on a laptop. So, and for number two, 
that's for a monkey. And for number three, that's for locust swarm. And for number four, which is a non-audible frequency, the LED lit up. So basically the non-audible frequency, which is the LED, it lit up because um, humans cannot hear it, but some other animals can. And also this is just a placeholder for now. And thank you so much for listening to my presentation. Um, do you have any questions? Thank you. Good job, Thank you. Really good. Does anyone have any questions? Okay. So next up, we have Omkar Sabani from Robbinsville Innovation 4 H Club, and he's presenting the tipper. So give him a round of applause. Let me share my screen. Okay, so let me go into my slides. Okay. Hi, my name is Umkar Sabani and I'm from the Robbinsville Innovation 4 H Club. My product is the Tipper. My personal experience that with the problem that I'm trying to solve is one time during COVID-19 when my family was trying to get pizza. We, want, we wanted to give the delivery person a tip because we knew that during these times it was dangerous to be outside and we couldn't give it to them by hand because of social distancing. So our plan was to put the money outside under where it couldn't fly away from. And then when the delivery person came, we would tell them with our nest doorbell where to look and then they took it. But as you can tell, it probably wasn't the best plan because here are some things that could have went wrong. Someone else could have seen us put the money and then they could have took it. The delivery person might not have heard us tell them and they might have not been comfortable touching the money but also this might not have worked for everyone because not everyone has a smart doorbell this is where the tipper comes in the problem is that during COVID-19 we have tried to stay inside our homes as much as possible but delivery people are outside most of the time so we want to express our gratitude by giving them a tip but during COVID-19 there's no way to make sure the delivery person gets it because you can't just give it to them because of social distancing here are some statistics. The number of deliveries of Amazon is 3 billion per year. The, the number of delivery drivers is 75,000. The average deliveries per driver per day is 110. And the average wage per driver is $15 per hour. So even if 10 to 20% of the people that they deliver to choose to give them a tip using our product, it makes a big difference to their lives. A few current solutions are only a few apps such as Instacart and Uber Eats have a built-in tipping mechanism, but Amazon, UPS, and USPS, who are the major um, deliver, delivery people in the world, have no provision of getting a tip as per my research. The solution is the tipper. It's a device that can make sure that your delivery person gets the tip that they deserve. All we have to do is select an amount for the tip from the designated app, then the delivery person will see the amount we gave them on an LCD screen and then they have to select a store on the, on the keypad. And then that data is sent to the app for the user to approve the store. Then a gift card code will be printed on the LCD screen and they can take a picture of it using their smartphone and, the code, and use the code for the store that they picked. It's that easy. How it works is what the circuit basically does is receive a command from the app with the Bluetooth module, sends the text to the LCD screen, and then it allows the delivery person to select a store from the keypad. Then that data is sent to the app using the Bluetooth module to the app. And then the app user will then approve that selection with the app. The circuit will then generate a gift card code for the corresponding store and a pin and print it on the, on the LCD screen. And then they use it like any other gift card code. Here are some of the components. And by the way, um, I'm still working on the version that I just talked about. My current version is using a serial monitor, but it does the exact same thing. Here's the circuit and the same thing. I'm only using the serial monitor version. And here's my sketch. Here are some screenshots of my code. And the main things that are happening here is like, this is where we are defining our variables and the setup in the first one. In the second amount, we're doing the authentication system. And in the third one, we're letting them pick the store and giving them the code. 
and doing them in the different code. What's next for my product is I will add an LCD screen and keypad. The keypad is for input from the delivery person. And I'm also currently working on integrating an app for input from the user of our product. I also still need to work with retailers to actually make the codes work. And then, thank you. I'll do a live demo right now. So if I just... Um, okay, and then here. So as you can see here, it's saying, hello, thanks for delivering, select your company. So what's happening right now is the authentication system and we're currently getting a delivery from Amazon. So as you can see, one is Amazon. So say I input something else like two equals US, UPS. So if I do that, it'll say incorrect and try again. So now let's say I actually do do Amazon. Then it'll say correct and then it'll let us pick a store. So then say I want a gift card for Apple. Then it'll say selected Apple, the store. And then here's your coupon code for the tip. And then here's your pin number. And then it'll say thank you for delivering. Thank you. Any questions? Oh, and uh, um, one more thing. I have, this is like um, just the, like a, um, a model of my product that I described in my slides. So as you can see, here's the LCD screen and here's the keypad. And on the inside, I have my Arduino board and all my circuitry. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Everyone give him a round of applause. You did amazing, great job. Thank you. Okay, great job, Omkar. Uh, next is Pujita Chipala from the Loudoun County Innovation Club and she will be presenting her smart backpack. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can. So hi, my name is Pujita Chapala. I'm a fifth grader and I belong to the Loudoun Innovation 4-H Club. My project is Smart Backpack. Introduction, did you know that 203,000 kids get kidnapped each year? In, in, in addition to that, 40% of kids have allergies. So what if there was a device that could alert a person if someone's near you and check if there are any dust or pollen particles in the air? The solution, is Smart Backpack. Why I chose Smart Backpack? I chose Smart Backpack because my younger sister is going to kindergarten and I want her to be safe when she's going and coming back from school. So I thought of Smart Backpack. I also have allergies and many times it's hard for me to play outside. So that's why I added the desk sensor to a Smart Backpack. Now I will be talking about the dust sensor. The dust sensor is a sensor that detects the pollen and dust particles in the air. It shows the level of dust on the computer screen. The dust sensor uses a photo sensor and an infrared light to detect particles. Now I will be talking about the PIR motion sensor. PIR stands for passive infrared. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Okay, PIR stands for passive infrared. Okay, the sensor detects anything within a 10 foot range. This, this sensor is mainly used in home security. It measures the infrared light and objects in its view, and it only detects things that have motion. It only and it also only detects things that have heat. This is a picture of the circuit of my project and some of the some of the device and some components i used are a pir motion sensor a dust sensor a breadboard a microcontroller some jumper wires a green and red led a buzzer two 
of some resistors in a power bank for power. Some future enhancements I want to add are number one, a GPS, so the parent can track where where the kid is and where like more where there are more pollen or dust particles so they can tell their kid to not go there. And the second future enhancement I want to add is to make it smaller. At the moment, it's kind of big. And since this will be in a backpack, I want it to be a little bit smaller so it doesn't use as much space as it does. And, and I want to add more sensors to this, to this device because at the moment, there are only two. And if there are more sensors, this device can be more useful. This is the demo video link. Thank you for listening. Now I will show a live demo. Um, so basically the dust sensor is here and the PIR motion sensor is here. And so basically I'm just gonna plug it into the power bank. Oh wait, one second. Okay, so as you can tell now, the LED is green because that means there's no dust or, or anything. Okay, you know, a first demonstrate the PIR motion sensor. So basically it's buzzing because I'm kind of near it. So if I stand here, it would buzz. One second, might take a long time. Okay, you know, I'm just going to move on to the dust sensor. So basically, to, for, I'm going to demonstrate by putting some powder onto a tissue paper. Yeah, you see, so now the PIR motion sensor is detect me here. So that's why it buzzed. So now, so now I'm just going to put some a little bit of powder on it. Gonna lightly sprinkle it on top. And this may take a long time because this isn't the actual um, product. When it is a real product, it's gonna go more faster. He's that. Okay, so. And sometimes it's because there's not as much powder as there needs to be. So just put a little bit more powder. Is this one? Okay, and so. Sometimes it's loose connection, but. Okay. okay. It usually works when I put powder on it. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. okay, um, Puzi. Uh, it, it's like uh, it's uh, dust sensitivity is a little low, right? So yeah, it, it's a great presentation. Sometimes good, it good glitches. So. Good job. Great job, Puzi. The project and presentation was amazing. Thank you for listening. Also, any questions? Uh, Great, I have a question, Pujita. Okay. 
a great, great work, actually. I really like your uh, work. So I have a question about the motion sensor. Mm -hmm. It's really good that, you know, it detects person, you know, when someone is approaching mm -hmm. or moving. What happens like when you have, you know, a group of people around you, would it still be like alerting you all the time or does it like stop? Um, well, for that, um, it would still probably buzz because there are a lot of people there. And that means there's like a person still has heat. So it would probably still buzz. Okay. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Yeah, good job. Like, you know what, what, how it works and uh, yeah, very well answered. Nice job. Yeah. Yeah, great project. Uh, next, Akhil and Nishant Madasi are going to be from Robinson Innovation Forage Club are going to be presenting the autonomous car. So give them a round of applause. My name is Nishant and I'm going to sixth grade. My name is Akil and I'm going to fifth grade. We are part of Robinsville Innovation 4-H Club. Our project is a car to go. Due to the current worldwide situation of COVID-19, there are certain situations in which there needs to be no contact, such as a COVID positive patient in a hospital. Our solution to this problem is a car to go. This project will be able to deliver medicines and essential products with no contact. This prototype will be able to carry a load of up to two pounds. As the size of the car gets larger, the load will also increase. The purpose of this car is to carry heavy stuff, delivery, deliver medication as a shopping cart, and so forth. The components we used is an Arduino Uno board, the motor seal, four DC motors, a wind board, a vinyl coin sample, jump wires, Bluetooth module, a chargeable battery pack, four wheels, glue gun, and solar eye. Our device has four DC motors and an Arduino Uno board. It also has a motor shield which lets you drive the four DC motors with the Arduino board allowing you to control the speed and direction of each one. It also has a it also has a Bluetooth module that is attached to the car and is connected to a Bluetooth receiver and a sample app. The Bluetooth module can cover a range of 30 feet between the app and the car. The Bluetooth module is designed for faster connections between an Android device and Arduino board. Now, these are some pictures of the process on how we built it. Now we will show you some pictures. Now we will show you what the cart looks like. As you can see, there are four DC motors. They're connected to the motor shield, which is um, connected to the top of the Bluetooth mod. Sorry, Uno board. The Bluetooth module is on the side. And here's the rechargeable battery pack. Now I'm going to show you how it works. As you can see, I, as you can see, I put this water bottle onto the car. I'm going to send it to my brother, who is all the way who's there. The future adaptation stuff we're going to be doing is an, an ultrasonic sensor for optical detection. Go ahead. 
the future adaptations that we're doing is add, is to add an ultrasonic sensor so that we can have optical detection and avoidance, add a GPS and make the car larger so it can hold heavier items. We're also going to work on adding, making the car autonomous. Thank you for listening to us. Any questions? Everyone give me a big hand. This was amazing. The project and presentation was very well and then very well presented. Okay, great job, Akil and Mishant. You guys did an awesome job. Next up is Yash Code from the Robinsville Innovation Club with the self-service system. Everyone give them a round of applause. Thanks, guys. All right, can you all see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. Hi, my name is Yash Code. I'm from the Roundsville Innovation Forage Club and my product is called the self-service system. So with this product, I decided to use it for restaurants and drive-thrus. So to get an overview, so do you know that every day um, in the United States, there are over, like there are 50 over, there are 50 million that drive-thrus serve over 50 million Americans a day. That's basically one in every six people living in the US. Also, there are 160,000 fast food restaurants all over the country, which is basically one for every 2,000 Americans. And more than a quarter of Americans order fast food restaurant food at least once a week from all these fast food restaurants like McDonald's or Taco Bell, Subway, all over the country. And about 3.6 million people or 2% of the American workforce is employed by fast food restaurants mainly because it is a high labor industry and is also notorious for paying low wages. So a problem is a lot of times there are mistakes when people place orders at a restaurant, especially through drive throughs And often when employees make mistakes, people go mad about it or they're very unhappy about it. So some examples are Wendy's, McDonald's, Chick-fil-A and Burger King, which uh, have certain percentage errors of um, the amount of times they make mistakes whenever they uh, deliver food to other people and other people receive the incorrect item. So this is why to fix this problem, I came up with a system that will avoid food order mistakes. So I called it the self-service system. So what it basically is, is a billboard that has a program run on it to take people's orders at a restaurant, just like an employee does. It does the exact same thing as an employee, but it has a computer-based voice and asks for the things that you'd like to order based off their menu. And it, and it displays all the questions and total price that you have to pay with tax on a billboard screen. And it's used to save time for employees from multitasking and also um, has, consumes less errors of mistakes from employees. So where is it used? is basically used in a drive-thru or in a restaurant, is used so that an employee does not have to take your order and it saves time for people from multitasking. And restaurants can, can use this to uh, grow their business. It can also be used in school lunches and cafeterias as well in the future. So that's my demo video. And this is the code. So these string items represent the items that the billboard will ask you which items you want to order. And these are the total prices in the code. So, and then these are all the strings and definitions that define this code. So I'll just skip through this. So these are the components I used right here is an RGB LED matrix. It's a 32 by 64 matrix right here. This is a Bluetooth module. Uh, this right here is an Arduino Mega connected to the Bluetooth module along with jumper wires, which are connected to the back of the RGB LED matrix. And I use two apps to uh, run this program, Bluetooth Terminal HC05. It's a text app where you can text what things you want to order. And this other app right here is the Arduino Voice Control app. You can 
say in an app what you'd like to order using your voice. So this is the build process and the sketch. So the sketch is right here. This is a basic layout of what it looks like. And then these are how to connect it to the Bluetooth modules and how to connect um, the connections to the RGB LED matrix. And then this is what the final circuit looks like, the exterior. So thank you. So now I will stop sharing my screen and I will present the demo. So in this demo, I'm going to use the Arduino voice control app since I find that more convenient. So I'm just going to load up this code and then we'll get straight to it. And this is the menu where people can look at it and decide what food they want to order. What would you like to order? Say done to quit. I'd like a hot dog. How many hot dogs would you like to order? Please enter a number. Because it asks for a number only, I can only enter a number without saying any other additional words. So three. Total price 6.00. What would you like to order? Say done to quit. I like bread. Item not found. What would you like to order? Say done to quit. So basically because bread is not an item on the menu, it does not recognize that. So that's why it says item not found. I can only choose an item from the menu. So I like a burger. How many, please enter a number. So I can only enter a number again, so two. Total price 15.00. What would you like to order? Say done to quit. So once I'm done with my order, I'm just going to say I'm all done. Total price plus tax $15.99. Thank you. So basically what this program did was it took all the items that I wanted. It added up the total price. And then when I said that I was done, it basically calculated the total price plus the tax I have to pay at the end. So thank you. Any questions? Um, I have one. Yes, go ahead. Um, if you were to, let's say, like place an order, like if this was like actually used in like actual like restaurants for drive throughs um, what happens if you like when you place an order and then like, I guess sometimes people take back their orders, I guess, change what they want. Is that like, is that, are you able to do that with whatever you have now or? Um, I haven't added anything like that to my um, order system as of right now, but that will be one of my future upgrades. Okay, got it. Anyone else? Yeah, yeah well done. Uh, that, yeah. Was, that was a really great presentation. Thank you so much. Everyone give him a round of applause. Thank you, guys. OK, uh, next up, we are doing Viba Qatar uh, from Loudoun Innovation 4-H Club. And she's presenting the interactive wall art. So please give her a round of applause. Um, um, Looks like you know, Ananya might be go. I mean, Viba might be going next. Is she here? Viba Qatar. I mean, Viba, are you here? Uh, I think Viba's moved to tomorrow. Um, oh, she moved to tomorrow. Okay, in that case, 
Uh, next up will be Ananya Rudder and she, from Robbinsville Innovation 4-H Club, and she'll be presenting the water level sensor. Please give her a round of applause. Hi, my name is Ananya Rudder. I'm going to sixth grade, and the club I'm in is Robbinsville Innovation 4-H Club, and my project's called the water level sensor. problem that I'm trying to solve. Many people can get problems without drinking enough water or drinking too much water. If you drink not enough water, you can get nausea, headaches, dizziness, and muscle cramping. If you drink more than what's needed, you can get confusion or dryness, brain damage that can even lead to coma. Stats. 75% of Americans get dehydrated and 80.1% of people get overhydrated. If we can measure and monitor and track the amount in a person drinks, we can we can measure, we can um assume the ill effects of drinking too much or too less water. Why I made this. My sister's always forgetting to drink water in school. And I want to help her with this issue so she drinks enough water in school. Many people can drink drink enough water or drink too much than what is needed, which can lead to various health issues. And my project can remind people to drink water and inform how much they have consumed so they can drink the right amount of water and keep them healthy. So this is my sketches that I started from the beginning of the project. I'm using sketch two that uses a water level sensor that detects the level of water in the bottle. And then in the future, I'm gonna be using sketch three that uses a water flow sensor to detect how much water a person's drinking. So this is my project code. Basically what happens in this part of the code, it, sh it shows the water level. So I use the, the threshold part. So anything below the lower threshold, my, pro my project will shine at red LED, which means that there's very little water in the bottle. And anything between the lower threshold and the upper threshold means that it may, my, the yellow LED will turn on in my project, which means it's my, the water level sensor is indicating halfway. And anything above the upper threshold, it's green, which means there's enough water to drink. And this is the continue part of the, the code. Basically it shows that the water level of this part is empty, which means that none of the LEDs will glow up. In the next part, it'll show that red LED will glow up, which means that it's indicating very little water. This, the third part shows that the, ye the yellow one will show up, which means halfway. The last one will show that there's enough water to drink, which means the green LED will turn on. So the components I used are LEDs, jumper wires, wire level sensor, breadboard, Arduino Uno, 9 volt battery, and resistors. So this is me building the circuit. So this is my demo video. Now I'm gonna be giving a live demo. So basically none of the LEDs are lighting up yet because there's the water looks is not in the water, it's not um, detecting any water nearby. So once I keep putting it in, it starts to glow red. And once I keep putting it in the water sensor, it turns yellow, which means there's enough water to drink, but not all the way full. Next, it'll turn all the way green, which means that it's enough water to drink. Thanks for watching and have any questions? That was really good. That was a really good presentation. Give her a round of applause. Next one is um, okay. Janet Henderson. Okay. okay. Uh, Ananya, Great job, Ananya. Um, next up is uh, Pranav Kalidini from the Loudoun County 4-H Club, and he will be presenting his 4-H pH sensor. So give him a round, a round of applause. So we have Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can yes. hear you.
We can hear you. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Pranav Kaladindi, and for this year's virtual Maker Fair, I made a pH sensor project. Next year, I'm going into seventh grade, and I'm in the Loudoun Innovation Club. My problem. So my problem is that the pH values in water is, are either too high or too low, meaning they're unstable and not safe to drink. Millions of people are dying every year from being intoxicated with low pH levels or high pH levels. And many are dying without even knowing how harmful pH can be to their body. So what is pH? pH is a substance that forms all our liquids. pH is created by hydrogen atoms bonding with ions in the air or water. And there, there's many ways to measure pH. If the pH level is below seven, it's considered acidic and it's not safe to drink. If it's within seven to 7.5 within that range, it's okay and neutral and it's like normal drinking water. While if it's over seven, if, while if it's over 7.5, it's unstable, and that means the compounds inside cannot be contained properly. So what does this project do? It reads values from a certain body of water or just any water source or any other liquid, it, and it transmits that, those readings to a custom PCB, to a custom PCB board, and which then takes those readings and displays it on an OLED screen so that people can read it and see how high or low the pH value is. My goal is to alert the people who are living in the conditions where the pH value is either too low or too high to know how bad the water that how bad it is of the water that they're drinking and encourage them to find a new water source. So who does this affect? In many countries like India, Kenya, et cetera, there are many lakes that are not healthy for humans. So Lake Nakuru in Kenya is a lake with a pH level of five, which is considered acidic. And this lake surprise a surprising, supplies a surprising 2.5 million people. And almost 500,000 farmers use this water for irrigation. This causes many people to die and crops to wither and famine causing famines occasionally. With the COVID-19 pandemic, many farmers are facing, facing issues with trying to sell and grow their crops, and this pH and the pH values being low just makes it even worse. So the components I used was a pH sensor, an Arduino Uno R3, a 9-volt battery or a power supply, an OLED screen, a custom PCB data collector board, and a few jumper boxes. So here are a few, here's two pictures of my circuit. Okay, so now I'll give you guys a live demo. So right now I have three different uh, liquids. So the first one is baking soda. And the second one is normal refrigerator water. And the third one is lemon water. Can I pause you for a second? Oh yeah. Could you stop sharing our screen so we can see oh. it? Okay. Thanks. One second. Did it stop? Did it stop sharing the screen? Yes, you are good, Prana. Uh, go. Okay. So I have three different substances. Uh, the first one is baking soda, the second one is normal refrigerator water, and the third one is lemon water. And the pH values are written down below so you know what it is. So the first one, I just put the pH sensor in the normal refrigerator water, and it's sending the uh, signals to the OLED screen, and right now it's reading pH values at 7.31, which is neutral and safe to drink. So now I'll take the pH sensor and put it into baking soda. So the baking soda water, it's going up the, the readings and baking soda water should be around eight to 10 in pH value. So right now it's going and it's showing on the OLED screen 8.2, 8.21 and around that range. So the, now you can see that the pH value is at between eight and 10, which is, which is unstable. 
Now I, will, now I will take the pH sensor and put it into lemon water. So lemon water should have a pH value of zero to two. And right now it is showing at dead zero. So you can, now you know the three different, the three pH values of three different substances. Does anyone have any questions? Yes. That's a great presentation, Pranav. I have a question. May I? Yeah. Awesome. Great presentation. So very good invention. That's a pH meter. So you have, you have showed with a couple of examples with the baking uh, soda water and uh, lemon water, right? Uh, I would recommend you to extend it towards uh, some uh, real-time solutions such as Coke, Pepsi, lemonade, uh, sparkling water. So like just an extension, this is a suggestion for like, you know, I would recommend you to show it to your uh, club kids, you know, how the real-time uh, solutions how, how your invention can detect the pH of real-time solutions and how, whether they are good or not, you can, uh, they can, you know, you can recommend that they can drinkable or not to your kids. Just a suggestion, all right? Great, wonderful invention, good luck. So Pranav, uh, this is uh, Dr. Hari. I have one question for you. So you did some research on this Kenyan uh, river Nukuru, yeah. as you mentioned. So can you do me a favor? Can you write up a one pager, a call for action? I have uh, good uh, connections in the uh, Kenyan um, government. So I would like to take this as a initiative to see what uh, the government can do to clean up this uh, river uh, so that uh, the people around it can benefit drinking a clean water and also the agriculture can be improved because of this acid. So affecting a lot of health directly or indirectly. So I would like to take this up as an action item to pursue this because of your um, invention, this, this came to light. There could be several other places your technology can be used to motivate people and make things provide a clean water. Thank you. Okay, uh, how would I send it to you? Uh, Pranav, we will yeah. connect uh, Harigaru to you, and uh, that's really a, a great help, um, uh, Harigaru, uh, and then Mahender uh, for uh, good sessions. So this is what, uh, like, you know, uh, having uh, uh, great leaders, like, you know, to uh, help you guys. This is one of the good examples. We will, we will make this through a 12-year-old kid of Kenya uh, who is campaigning a big way. And she came uh, one of the speakers in the last Lead India initiative. So I will connect to these youngsters so that they could campaign for a clean water. Thank you so much. Yeah, the, perfect. So now you have the like uh, uses for your product and the, well done. Uh, I'm really happy. Like even though you're the first year with the Ashburn Innovation Club, you you really rocked. Like you know the very detail, and um, I'm really uh, glad for you. Good job. Thank you. Please give him a round of applause. You did amazing. Great project. So next, we're going to have Jenny and Henderson Han with their safety bike, and they're from Robbinsville Innovation Forage Club. Hi, my name is Jenny Han. I'm Henderson, and we're going to seventh grade this year and we're from the Robinson Innovation Forage Club. So did you know that there are more than 700 bicycle fatalities in the US each year? And we are trying to reduce that number of injuries and deaths by creating a new product, the safety bike. So the safety bike is a product that will alert the rider when there is an object nearby. And our product is both portable and attachable. The safety bike contains features that will help the rider. This is our logo. And I chose to name our product the safety bike because it means to be safe while biking. I drew a bike in the middle of our logo because our bike benefits bikers the most. I colored our logo the color green because it represents health and safety. There are three parts of the circuit. The first part is the NXT brake. It's the heart of the circuit and it sends code to the other two parts. The ultrasonic sensor, I programmed it to th see things that are 50 inches away. Um, I thought it would be a safe distance and 
I mounted it on the back of the bike so it could see things from behind. Once it detects an object, it will say object detected to remind the biker to stay more aware of the object behind him. I also added a light sensor. It's supposed to um, tell you how dark the night is. If it's dark enough, then it will say night to remind the biker to pay more attention because it's night. Here's the code here, so you can see anytime. For your reference. For people with bad eyesight, we can add ultrasonic sensors on the right, left, and front. So the sensors from both sides can, can detect objects within in 50 inches away and alert the rider by saying object detected. Our next generation is gonna help people who have bad hearing. So we're gonna add a motor next to the person's hand and it will hit the person's hand whenever an ultrasonic sensor sees something to remind the biker to stay like to stay aware of its surroundings. To make most people be able to afford our product, we are trying to low, lower the price to as low as possible. The price is currently $40, which we think should be affordable to most people. We also inserted a demo video here for you to watch anytime you want. Thank you for watching our slideshow. And I'll show you a live demo. So to turn on the NXT booth, you press the orange button. And then you press it four more times. Uh, it's it's currently saying night right because it's kind of dark in here. So yeah, only sort of time to see something, it should say object detected. And yeah, and I'll say night when it since it's actually so I'll put my hand over it. See, it says night. And so yeah, whenever you're done biking to turn it off, you just have to press the great button five times. And then press the orange button one more time to turn it off. I hope you liked our project. And we are glad to answer any questions you may have. Thank you for watching. Yeah, excellent. Uh, yeah, excellent presentation, both Jenny and uh, Henderson. It's like you know, it's one of the uh, the product. The, the you know the concept of the what we have been teaching you guys like uh, think logos product like in you know, a cost you guys did amazing job like it's it's I, I would say this is kind of a, a end product solution and then I'm we are really happy uh, to see this one you did great guys you did very the project was very good okay. Thank so you. next, we're having Bia Pichara with her sign language glove, and she's from Robbinsville Innovation 4-H Club. So please give her a round of applause. I think you're muted. Dia, can you also turn on your camera if possible? Okay. 34 million of the people that have disabling hearing loss are children and it's hard for them to communicate with their classmates, family or peers as not many nonverbal people learn to speak. The problem my sign language glove translator is addressing the com is a communication gap between deaf people or people with conditions that cause them to be nonverbal and other people. 
It can be hard to communicate with people when using sign language, especially if the other person doesn't know sign language. That's what the sign language translator is for. The solution. What my project does is when a person uses sign language, the translator converts the signs into English, which are then displayed on an Android app called the Bluetooth emulator. This allows a deaf person to communicate with someone else. My competence, the Arduino Nano R3, the HCO5 Bluetooth module, flex sensors, the Adafruit analog accelerometer, 1K and 10K resistors, jumper wires, uh, a PCB board, and a soldering iron. How the components are used. The Arduino Nano R3 is the center of my circuit and it's a compact microcontroller that sends out directions. My Bluetooth module allows short range wireless transmission to the host device, which in my case is my phone, which has the Bluetooth emulator app on it. For the flex sensors, it measures the amount of bend applied to the sensor and the Adafruit analog accelerometer measures the tilt in my palm. The flex sensors that measure the bend of your fingers send information to the Arduino Nano microcontroller, which understands the values and sends the outcome to the Arduino app using the Bluetooth module. Some challenges that we faced were finding the exact angle measures for the bend of each finger using the flex sensors. This took us a really long time because we had to use trial and error until we got the correct values. It was also difficult to assemble all the components on the glove because there was a limited amount of space. Also, because we were moving the glove, we had to find a way to make sure everything didn't fall off, so we used a soldering iron. This is my circuit diagram. It shows the five flex sensors are connected to A0 and A5 of the Arduino Nano. For the accelerometer, X, y, X out and Y out are connected to A5 and A6 on the Arduino Nano. And for the Bluetooth module, TX and RX are connected to D5 and D4 on the Arduino Nano. This also shows that the flex sensors are connected to, each one is connected to a 10K resistor and five volts as a power source. And for the accelerometer and the Bluetooth module, they're also connected to a five volt power source and ground. This is the code. The analog read, it reads data points between the, uh, the accelerometer and the flex sensors. The, const the constraint function, it means there's a set of values between the flex sensors, which in this case, the minimum is 780 and the maximum is 910 and it doesn't allow the bend to be anywhere higher or lower between those two values. The map function at the bottom is where it maps um, two different ranges. So, it, so in this case, it maps the, the minimum of 780 and the maximum of 910, and it converts it to zero through 90 degrees. So when you bend your fingers, the bend has to be in between zero degrees and 90 degrees. This is another part of the code. Uh, it shows all the 26 letters. It shows that there's five different angles for each of the five different flex sensors. So when each of the angles match up with uh, the angles here, the, you can see the sign, but some of the letters don't only use the five angles. They use the X and Y out, um, axis for the accelerometer as well, which measures the tilt in your palm. This is a picture of the building process. This is my circuit. And some future enhancements that we can do are we're gonna create our, create our own Android app so it'll speak all the letters out loud when someone signs them and we'll modify it to accommodate full words and eventually whole phrases. Now I'm gonna show you the demo. Okay, so here's the project. Okay, so these are the five flex sensors right here. Okay, and then these are jumper wires. Right here is a P right here is the PCB board. Uh, here is the accelerometer. And on this side, there's a Bluetooth module. You can't really see it right now. There's a Bluetooth module right here. So how you use this is there's this app called the Bluetooth emulator. So you scan for nearby devices. 
And then the Bluetooth module will show up. It's called the HCO5. HCO5. You click on it and then you type in a pin, one, two, three, four. And then it shows up on your screen. And then when you click on it, this is the Bluetooth terminal. So when you sign a letter, it should show up on the Bluetooth uh, terminal. For example, if you sign any letter, see that's the letter, it, it, it'll, it'll take a minute to show up because it's sending, it's receiving a lot of information. See, this is the letter O. And if you keep putting your hand in that sign, the letters will keep showing up. See, that's, a, that's the letter B now. And see the letter B show, shows up at the very end. So that's how my project works. Thank you. Excellent. Great job, Dio. Thank you. And does anyone have any questions? Uh, excellent presentation, Dia. It's like um, I see the way the concept from the beginning to end. You you made it like an amazing, very detailed, and uh, we're really very happy and great going. Looks like you didn't pay the guy you hired. He's not showing the gloves properly. So yeah, so he has to do better job on next time. But awesome I means you look at that like uh, yeah, see the work. You did it right. Like all the, it's not easy to work with those flex sensor, Bluetooth, and all. So it's it's it. I'm I'm glad I'm glad you, you it's it's a great product, and I'm sure um, you, you are in high school. It's going to uh, yield to a better opportunities. Yeah, good luck. Okay. Yeah, congrats, Thank you. So Dia, when are you going to have this uh, app available in App Store app stores? Um, we're working on it right now. It'll probably be done soon though. Like maybe a couple of weeks in the next month. Excellent. Wish you all the best and look forward to downloading it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Great job, Dia. That was great. Um, next up is Timur Madhusudan with the wearable illumination safety from the Robbinsville Innovation 4-H Club. Please give her a round of applause. Okay, can you guys hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay, um, first of all, I'd like to introduce myself. Hello, I'm Simran Madhusudan, and I'm going to seventh grade, and I'm part of Robbinsville Innovation 4 H Club. My project is called WIS, or Wearable Illumination Safety. The problem. Many people get hit by cars every night while walking or biking, etc., despite roaming around safely. So uh, with people like normal people getting hurt so much because of cars hitting them, those with visual impaired have a much higher chance of being in danger during nighttime. So it's very dangerous at nighttime for, for, pedest for, for pedestrians to roam around due to lack of light and also due to speeding drivers. Statistics. Approximately one third or 31% of 16 and 17 year old drivers in the US involved in fatal crashes from 2009 to 2014 crashed between 9 p.m. and 6 a.m. So again, that nighttime period when it's dark, a lot of people are involved in fatal crashes and that's not good. In 2016, the deadliest three hour period was midnight to 3 a.m. on Saturdays with 1,015 fatal crashes, closely followed by 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. on the same day with 1,001 crashes. So that three hour period again, very, very dangerous at night, 1,015 to 1,001 crashes, that's a lot of harmful crashes. And while we do only one quarter of our driving at night, 50% of traffic deaths happen more at night. More than 40,000 people were killed in car crashes in 2016, according to injury facts. So despite very little people roaming around at night in cars, a lot of our crashes happen at that kind of time period. My project, 
Um, so this product can detect light from a car's headlights. And when that light is detected, the buzzer will play a tune and the LED bar graph will light up. So the lily pad will light up, notifying a person that a car is coming. So it's located on the back of the shirt so that the, when the car light is, headlight is detected, uh, a person will be able to move out of the way and avoid getting hit. So the materials I used for my project is the lily pad ProtoSnap Plus. It's over here, it's, it's suitable and um, like onto a shirt and I can use conductive thread to use it. Um, I have my light sensor over here, detect light. Um, I have my buzzer, it can play a tune. And um, my bar graph is going to be on my LED, I mean my lily pad, they're right here. And um, this is my conductive thread used to connect and let the power flow between all of my uh, components. And uh, this is my e textiles battery to provide uh, power. And this is my USB microphone. So the reason I made my project is because drivers can be speeding in the dark and not looking where they're going. So the person themselves, when they're wearing the shirt, they should be able to know when a car is coming at them so they can react fast. Um, a driver might, might not be able to see them. And even if they do, it might take a little time for them to process and like actually stop the car. So uh, people can usually move, uh, can react faster, like when they're actually walking. So if the person is alerted, then they can be safe and avoid getting hit. So these are pictures of my circuit. This is the building process. Um, and um, some future plans I have is um, an RGB LED and temperature sensor. So basically what an RGB and LED, LED is, is it's a red and green and blue sensor, um, LED all combined into one. So there's three colors in it and the temperature sensor basically senses temperature. And what I want to do with these two is that uh, whenever something is too hot, I want the RGB LED to turn red. Whenever it's just right, I want it to be green. And when something is too cold, I want it to turn blue. So it can help people avoid getting overheated and stuff like that. I also plan to add LEDs on the outside, bigger ones, so that people can actually be seen more thoroughly in the night. I would also like to put a range on, light, on the light sensor so that it will only sense light from the uh, headlights of a car instead of sensing other things like little street lights and stuff like that. Okay, so now I will demo my project. Okay, um, as you can see here, um, this, it, these are my LEDs. This is my LED bar graph. This is my buzzer. And then this is my light sensor. So basically what will happen is when I get power from my e-textiles battery, um, the power transfer from the A2 will go to my light sensor and one light is detected from the light sensor it will um the power will flow through the um, conductive thread and go to the buzzer and the buzzer will play a tune notifying the person that's wearing the shirt so um let me just turn on my project and uh it's very faint because there's a little there's very little voltage on this so i don't not, i'm not sure if you can hear the buzzer but it's buzzing and whenever i cover the light sensor it does not buzz considering it's dark and there's no light. These are some LEDs that light up as well when it can sense light so that the person can be seen. That's my project and uh, thank you for listening everybody. Any questions? Uh, that, that's, that's amazing uh, uh, the presentation again, uh, Simran. Uh, I don't need to say you, you always uh, do the best. Uh, Dr. Harigaru, like, uh, remember, like I've been talking about uh, the eat like a smart thread project, yes. which is basically, uh, it's my like a, a dream project, like where you can able to connect, uh, like a, a conductive thread, you can see as part of your like weaving process that that's this is a prototype of that that tiny e textile one is the one can control it, like, you know, it can go into the fashion designing and all these things. So that what she has done this year, we, we picked a, a smart thread as a concept. They learned all this, like even further tiny microcontrollers and wearable objects and all. And today what Simran demonstrated is a, is, is end result of that. And we have another 
uh, product in the uh, same like an you know, e-textile tomorrow we are showcasing it and uh, we are, i'm glad like you know uh, it, it's a very complicated process it's not easy i i'm uh, she has gone through a very tough time like even i tried a lot of times failed but you really did a very great job uh, simran congratulations simran very impressive and um, it will definitely save many lives i think that's our end goal even you save a single life that means a lot uh, wonderful presentation and congratulations look forward to your uh, final products uh, hitting the market thank you on a side note uh, the simran like uh, harigar help a lot of uh, uh, like promote all the like you know um, the viewers community and all the helping the their livelihood and all if your your product right if uh, suppose a, a small product a sari or something if it cost like 1000 rupees or 2000 rupees adding additional technology to that the celebrities can go it and the product value will multiply right so that's the that's the end, uh, the reason we put this one so the hope we can see some light on this project to put it into fashion shows and harigaru has some connection with uh, uh, the fashion technology in hyderabad i think so so we'll see if yeah, something yeah, we, will, comes we will connect uh, i just want to take one more uh, minute uh, uh, ramgaru sure, so sir. this is a wonderful thing i decided to stay back and watch all these things but the my interest is um we are doing one world record event on uh, october uh, 15th spanning into 16th on the occasion of dr kalam's 89th birthday getting into the 90th birthday it's a world record event we're starting with australia coming to japan singapore india middle east europe eastern europe um, north america south america and going back to india Uh, to uh, do the valedictory session it's a world record event uh, already approved by the world records organization so we would like to we dedicate one session exclusively for the youth out of the 10 sessions we doing globally and um, we would like to i will talk to you offline but we would like to enter into 4h lead india and 4h club we would like to enter into a collaboration and sign an mou to wherever the 4h clubs are involved would lead india i would like to associate with it and promote this as much as possible our goal is to providing um in the rural areas the pura providing urban amenities in rural areas in many areas healthcare education um environment agriculture are to enable people to earn their living respectfully so let's talk offline i would like to what are the process you have in place at the 4h level at the highest level lead india will enter into an uh, mou to promote together this concept and engage as many children as possible globally yeah that would be really grateful sir like it's a, it's a, it's glad uh, yeah I'm, i'm really happy things are working out Yes, yes and we will involve uh, select uh, projects and select children to speak in this uh, global event and everybody will get a uh, the entire team we will ensure that uh, whoever is involved in that particular project receives a world record certificate perfect sir awesome yes, thank you yeah. thank, thank you, you. Yes. great job so many did amazing everyone please give her a round of applause Okay. Uh, great job, Simran. That was wonderful. Um, next up is Zeba Qatar from the Laudan Innovation Club, and she will be presenting her interactive wall art. Please give her a warm welcome. Hi, my name is Rebecca Tar and I'm going to 5th grade. I'm a junior and I'm part of the 4H Ashburn Innovation Club and my project is the interactive wall art. The problem I am addressing is when a kid is going to sleep and there's no music to listen, you could use my interactive wall art to sing. You could just sing a song by just touching the canvas. The reason why I made it is because this project involves art and I love art. Another reason I chose this is because I like playing around with bare conductor supplies. The last reason I made this is because I like music and this project sings any song you want.
Components used is the bare conducted touch board kit, and that includes a touch board, bare conducted paint, micro SD card, micro SD card reader, mini speaker, micro USB cable, polka dot clips, items that were not in the kit was a, was a canvas, brushes, and acrylic paints. <clears throat> the process. First, I chose a canvas and then I sketched the flowers. And next, I painted it with acrylic paints. Then I chose three songs I liked and then saved it into the micro SD card with the micro SD adapter that goes in the touch board. <clears throat> I used conductive black paint to pass to the electrodes on the touch board. The speaker and the USB cable are connected to the touch board for power and sound. The touch board has 12 electrodes, but I only use three. I save songs based on the required naming standards. As per the touch board's micro SD card, these songs must be saved as an MP3 format. Once everything is done, you, you can touch the flower or the stem where the black conductive paint is. <clears throat> Picture the final project. Front of it, back of it. <clears throat> How it works. The black, con the black conductive paint is connected to the back of the canvas. The crocodile clips is clipped this to the staples of the canvas. The crocodile clips, the mini speaker, and the USB cable is attached to the touch board, which has 12 electrodes for 12 songs. I'm going to show the live demo. Thank you for listening. Okay. So so I'm gonna, so this is how the connection, so the black paint um, goes through the, so the connection that goes to the black, connect the black paint through a corporate clips, touch board, and then that's how it gets the power. So I'm gonna touch the first flower. Um. Viva, can you stop sharing your screen so everybody can see your video? Okay, I'm going to be touching the second flower. I'm going to be touching the third flower. So that, that's how my project works. Any questions? Can you enable uh, voice commands also? Great job, Viva. You did amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Viba, you have a question from Dr. Hari? Yeah, Can yeah. You? Is it possible to voice enable, like uh, calling each flower may have like a specific name or something like that and say, instead of touching, you can voice enable like Alexa? Like that's 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 my, my next project. Okay, great. Thank I you. Suggestion. So, um, because there are only three songs on here that you could play, um, are you, would you consider adding, connecting it to an app so that whenever you want to listen to any song that you want, you could just go to that app and tell it what song you want to play by like any artist? No, you, yeah, I could do that too. Okay. Uh, excellent uh, pr presentation, uh, Viva. I, even though she has very, like, you know, um, uh, less time and then uh, she came the, you look at that the artistical scale like what she has it right the canvas she painted is amazing and then the kind of like work she did it so that this is a, a one of the thing we always tell it what you are interested and we bring the technology into that one 
So this is one of the um, the part of the, our programmable arts. The kids has different. Not everybody needs to go engineer, doctor, and all. Whatever they are, we can add more value. And uh, she did amazing. It's like it's very surprising, like the way she did. And uh, this device, Dr. Harigar, what she can do is like she can add a heat sensing. Means different. Um, there is more. We 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 did some work uh, on presented records also. You can wave around your paint, and then the illumination. All the whole things can be done around that tiny uh, circuit over there. And uh, we we will mentor her to uh, like a, my, our vision is to showcase this in one of the uh, museums to make it little more advanced, and then when people come to the paint, and then they can see different version of the art. It's wonderful, Ram. One thing you mentioned is uh, enabling them to pursue their passion. For example, in most of the projects in the world fail because not identifying what their interest and skill is. I'll share in a very uh, simple way. Um, people need to re recognize who is a monkey and who is a fish. Having fish to swim in the water, they can perform well. Having monkey to climb trees, it can do a wonders. Right. Most of the time, the mismatch happens. The parents expect the kid to become a doctor or a, an engineer or a lawyer, but whereas their passion is to do something else. If we could identify early, I think 4-H and with these through projects, we'll identify what their passion is, what their skill is, what their interest is. I think uh, connecting those things to pursue their passion is that everybody can become uh, successful. I think that's what we, we all have to do. Um, identifying who's a monkey and who's a fish and uh, measuring a performance of a fish to climb a tree, it will fail. And uh, having a monkey to swim competing with a fish, it will fail. So I think these projects will bring their creativity and their interest out and hopefully parents will support and encourage them. And with the help of uh, 4-H Club, uh, they, will, they can really go a long way to transform the world and uh, solve the social problems that we are facing. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, I, I, it's a lot of like parents, um, like, you know, other than mentors, like it's a parents, a lot of uh, their encouragement and all these things. It's amazing. Like I would say thank you to all the parents, uh, like, you know, bearing with us, like, you know, we keep telling changes and all they're doing it. Awesome. Good job. Yeah, I also would like to add a, 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 a new statement here. Dr. Harigar, I think that's a great message that you have passed on to all the parents who are watching. Also, we are live on the Facebook too. If anybody is watching, I think that's a great message about how to encourage uh, your kids to pursue their uh, dreams and career in the area of interest. Yeah, thank you very much. Please give Vibha a great round of applause. You did amazing. The project was very well presented and it was great. Please give her a round of applause. Okay, so that basically so that basically concludes all of the presentations for today. And I would like everyone to give I would like everyone to give the presenters a round of applause because they did amazing and their projects are extraordinary. And yeah, please give them a round of applause. Are you ready? Next up, wait, wait. Next up we have our uh, Arya Kode and he's the He's going to be talking about the club operations during COVID-19. So please give him a warm welcome. So Arya, you can go ahead. And um, Arya is one of our ambassadors uh, who will be representing our club. Hello. Yep, we can see it. Okay. Well, I would like to thank everyone for um, joining this meeting and letting me talk about this club. And I hope you all are doing well during this quarantine. So club meetings during quarantine. The meetings were over Zoom, so there was no contact and we all were like safe during all the stuff and meetings were just as functional as in person and online because as you could see all these people we, we weren't in class they were online so 
It was very good. Transition from in person to online was not delayed because I pulled my hair. Um, one, like from in person class, they didn't take lots of time to change it to online. They did it right away. So that's a good thing that happened. And down, down here is a picture of a club meeting during COVID-19. So STEM camp during quarantine. The camp was very helpful for people who joined and about 30 plus students participated and they're all at different grade levels. And also they made about six projects during the STEM camp and each STEM, the STEM camp was focused on one area of like circ of inventions but as for the 4-H club it's about all areas projects that were completed during quarantine there are 10 plus projects completed during this quarantine period which is about march to august as for example like as you've seen the water level sensor which shows you the water level of the water in the glass or the self-service machine, which takes your order and calculates the cost. And the guest speaker that talked before this session was Dr. Mahinder Dawal, and he talked about chemistry and how it's connected to cures. And this is a flyer of the webinar and how that was about chemistry and how it's connected to a cure. Summary. In conclusion, the 4-H Innovation Club helped us to keep occupied and safe during quarantine so we don't have to sit around and just be bored. And they also learned new concepts in IoT and we, were, we could be, be, be creative with our ideas. So we could um, just make whatever we want that comes up to our mind. And then we could build our own project with our ideas. And personally, this club helped me a lot so I could expand my imagination and build the projects. And thank you for listening to my presentation. And I hope you all are doing great today and hope you stay safe. Thank you. Good job, Arya. Thank you, Arya. Um, thank you, Arya, for going through um, our club's journey throughout the um, pandemic. Um, although it was hard, um, we got through it and we were able to um, end with a lot of wonderful products and projects throughout the future. I think we, we finished all the projects for today a little early and um, that concludes like, you know, a great success of like the projects what we showcased today. And tomorrow we have um, a lot of uh, in very interesting, uh, very diversified products. Uh, we are going to uh, showcase it. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a mix of uh, a pattern we put in for the scheduling and it's going to be very interesting. Uh, you can see a vast variety of uh, M Health, E Textile, uh, like um, the um, it, it, it's a lot of new uh, products will be there tomorrow. Please tell your friends and everybody um, join us and encourage. If th this is a great success, I never expected it's going to be uh, like this, and I'm proud of you guys. Uh, great job, leaders and uh, all the club mentors and parents and uh, the club members. Ramdar, I just yes, want to say one last word. Yeah, I have thoroughly enjoyed the, all the inventions from the kids. Uh, I'm really, uh, I'm really impressed with their you know, thought process, thinking, innovation. You know, I wish you all the best, kids. You know, keep it up, keep up going, all the good work. Uh, you know, like uh, Hari Garu said, like and love what you're doing, and you'll enjoy it. Good luck, yeah. all the best. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Ram. I think a great um, organization you, you, your team has led and uh, keeping them engaged is the key here. I think they are um, very creative. Uh, the creativity, uh, genetically, we are all identical. It's a question of providing that mentorship and proper guidance to bring their uh, innovation and uh, skills out. I think uh, 4-H Club is successfully doing that. 
Um, so I would like to offer one more thing. On September 5th uh, in India, it's a teacher's day. On that occasion, the Lead India is doing one uh, global webinar. Uh, the title of that is Transforming the Future of Education, the Role of Teachers, Students, and Parents. So we are having uh, from almost several countries, different speakers. We have uh, teachers, we have parents and students. So this is already overcrowded, but I would like to somehow squeeze five minutes of the time to bring you nominate one student who, who can present how the 4-H initiatives can transform the future of education. So we will talk offline and that is on September 5th, 9 a.m. Eastern time for three hours. And we will squeeze, uh, everybody gets like five to seven minutes. We'll squeeze about five minutes to one of your uh, top uh, student and a project who can present it. Uh, instead of live presentation, they can do the demo in a proper recording. That way we'll save some time or whichever way it works, but uh, we will talk offline. I think that will be wonderful to showcase to the world what uh, this particular Robbinsville Club is doing uh, through 4-H. Thank you so much. Yeah, definitely. Uh, thanks, sir. Um... Uh, thanks, Harigaru, for giving a lot of opportunities, and definitely we will uh, like uh, we'll we'll let the club leaders to present that as a um, the, our club model itself like is just basically made of the teachers like who mentored us, right? We have a train a trainer program like yes. that's what okay. we are doing. It we can talk about that, and uh, like thanks uh, Mahendra Garu for your kind words and encouragement. And uh, tomorrow there will be a lot more uh, M Health related uh, innovation sensors, and then E Textile, amazing like E Textile stuff. Uh, I'm more passionate about E Textile um, because like it's you know it touches me like uh, personally. So we will do more projects and then like you know we'll, we'll, we'll see that. Thank you all for attending this. Thank you. Okay, I would like to give uh, one final thank you for all the guests for attending. We couldn't have done this all without you both. Um, speakers and the guests we would also like to thank all the presenters and give them a big round of applause right now so thank you all for coming thank you um to everyone all the presenters all the guests all the mentors parents um we wouldn't have been doing this without your all of your support um all the presenters did such a great job to be here to come to this point i just want to congratulate you all and thank you again yeah, one, one last question of thanks. Uh, thanks to 4-H for helping us, uh, giving us a Zoom link uh, for two days. Uh, it's not easy to, you know, uh, get these kind of facilities. So thanks to Chad, um, Altera, and uh, Janet, uh, you know, for helping us out. I would like to request uh, uh, Mr. Krishna to say a few words. Uh, Krishna is uh, one of our uh, club mentors who has been with this journey for the last several years. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay. yeah uh, this has been a great opportunity. Um, I was just getting involved as a parent in the club and, uh, and has been very proud to be part of this, um, especially with uh, motivated people like uh, Mr. Ram and Mr. Sukesh. I consider myself fortunate to be part of this club and uh, getting the opportunity to help a lot of uh, kids who are very, very smart. They just need, um, I guess, to know what's out there and what can be done with their potential. Um, I thank you, both the Robinsville Innovation Club and the 4 Club to give me the opportunity to be a part of it. Thanks everyone. All right, so thank you all. And uh, we will request you to join us back tomorrow. Uh, it is part at 10 o'clock sharp. Thank you all and have a good rest of the Saturday. Bye, guys. Bye. 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 Bye.